You're listening to Travel Nursing and Allied Life, hosted by Travcon. Welcome to the Travel Nursing and Allied Life podcast. Very excited today to have Hannah Cork join us. She is a also a podcaster with her cohort, Emily. Welcome to the podcast, Hannah. Thanks for joining. Thank you so much for having me. This is so exciting. I was very excited to hear that you also do a podcast and you have a super funny title. I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> it's Drunk or Delirious. You're probably wondering why. <laughs> That's exactly it. I wanted to uh, tell us first a little bit about you and what your background is and where you work. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm Hannah. I grew up in New Jersey um, and I went to nursing school over in Pittsburgh and got my first couple years of nursing experience there. I'm a NICU nurse um, and that's all I've ever done. I only take care of the little ones. <laughs> those, um, those little ones frighten me uh, <laughs> very much. So I've only dealt with the big humans. So, and big I do... frighten me, so I get it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. <laughs> oh my gosh. Yeah. So that's, that's all I've ever done. I, I love it so much. Um, got a couple years of experience there and then I always knew I wanted to be a travel nurse. So um, I started doing that in 2018 and I traveled like all over the West coast. I did California, Washington, Colorado, Arizona. Um, and then I came back to Pennsylvania where I am now. And I'm currently at the children's hospital of Pencil- or of Philadelphia, um, CHOP. So, um, that's where I am currently. And yeah, that's a little bit about me. <laughs> that's really cool. Uh, I was about five years into it when I took the plunge into travel nursing. Oh, so- awesome. I had hopped around and done a few units, which was really helpful just to have done a little bit before I went into travel nursing. Mm -hmm. And then when I hit the travel nursing side, I was very thankful to have that experience going to different places. So we usually always recommend people have at least two years experience as a nurse. I know that uh, therapists say that they can, it's much easier for them to hop straight into traveling. So PT, OT, RT, they can sort of hop straight into traveling, but for nursing, we, we do recommend a couple of years just because so much gets thrown at you. And, you know, the attitude is you're a traveler. You should be able to handle it, you know? Right. I would say like two years at the bare minimum for sure. Um, I think nowadays people are leaving after like a year and going into it, which it's a little risky just for your, your license and everything. Yeah. Just because like you said, you kind of are expected to be able to know what you're doing. I mean, it's yeah. okay to questions. I, I always ask questions. You're not going to know everything, but you need to have that like core foundation of how to prioritize and, um, you know, how to, your nursing skills needs, you need to be confident in that. For sure. We have a couple of NICU nurses on the Travcon committee and we're recording this. What is this end of March? And they said, it's just totally dried up where they had the big boom, where they were, you know, in super demand. NICU really has these fluctuations where yes. it's like, okay, everyone's on vacation. We need you now. Yep. And uh, no, we have zero openings for you. So how do you find the job market right now? I do feel like it's definitely slowed down and it's, but it's hard to say whether the the travel nurse community is just oversaturated right now, because I think so many people are leaving because they're like so attracted to the lifestyle mm-hmm. and the money, of course, too. Um, so I think that's definitely a factor of it, but I do think it does tend to slow down always in the summer and then a certain wave that tends to Yeah, I think on. the, once you pass Christmas, <laughs> then it slows down for NICU. And then once people yeah. start going on vacation in the summer, then there's demand again. Right. Yeah. I don't, yeah. I don't know what the pattern seems to be, but, um, I, um, I have a contract right now and I'm actually done in three weeks. So I'm going to take some time off after that, but I'm hoping that come June, I'm able to find something. Yeah. Um, I've seen a few jobs, but I think they're getting snatched up pretty quickly. So, yeah. and you just hit the nail on the head right now, right there. When you said, I think I'm going to take some time off, you know, that's just <laughs> out of all the uncertainty that a travel traveler has, they can get canceled. You you know, they're sort of last minute. Everything is you've got a fair amount of stress as a traveler, so much more than just showing up and knowing your job is there as a, as a staff nurse. But then there's that carrot, which Mm -hmm. is, I think I'm going to take some time off between contracts and it might be two weeks. It might be six weeks, you know, whatever it is, but you've got (laughs) that. No, uh, no one can say, no, you can't take vacation. We just don't have anyone to cover you. So uh, that was the part I found the most attractive to being a traveler was 
you can take time off whenever you want. You know, your assignment's ending. You're going to take some time off. It was really cool. I love the flexibility of it. I took five months off actually last year. What did you do with it? Bit much. <laughs> um, so I went to Utah. That's where my parents are retired. Um, and I went there in February. So I had a good chunk of ski season left. So I skied like every day for about a month or two. I did that. And then I did all the Utah national parks in the summertime, which was amazing. <sighs> that is really cool. And that is some of the things that we did. I took an assignment in Utah and I okay. did the university hospital okay. uh, and, and they actually didn't do travelers. I, I take that back. They didn't take travelers. So I signed on per diem oh, and nice. it took them two months to orient me to all their ICUs and, and go through everything. And I was like, oh my God, I'm only here for three or four months. <laughs> yeah. But I ended up staying, I think four or five months and just enjoyed everything of Utah. It was gorgeous. Is that hospital in Salt Lake? Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's, oh my gosh. I love Salt Lake. It's a little bit underrated, I think. (laughs) Oh, I, people were sitting here going, why, why are you going to Utah? And I'm like, are you kidding me? It's gorgeous here. You know, and we did the grand Canyon last minute where normally you have to book that so far in advance. We were able to, we called up, we were able to get in. So we did a lot of the national parks as well. It was cool. We were in an RV so we could go anywhere. I love that. I, if I were to do it, I mean, I am still traveling, but I'm kind of doing a more local version. But um, if I were to ever go across the country, then I think I would do it in an RV because it just makes it like it's your home. It's like you always have your home. You always have yes. your bed. You're so mobile. Yeah. I just think it's a great way to do it. The other thing, too, is a lot of the times, you know, we we really liked it. So we wanted to stay three or four more weeks or maybe two months or something. And when we were doing apartments, they were kind of like, oh, well, it's not available. It's rented out. You were really tied to what was in the, that, um, in the apartment. Whereas with the RV, we could extend, we could shorten, we could do whatever we wanted. We were so much more flexible. Yeah. That's amazing. So tell us now about your podcast, uh, why you started it and what it's about. Yeah. So I met my friend, Emily on a travel assignment, actually in Denver. Um, we were both at the children's hospital out there and we were both on the night shift and it was one of those friendships where you you start talking and you just like click immediately and we became really really fast friends and we've both worked a lot of nights and i feel like for us we've met a lot of really close friends on night shift because you have t- typically not always but typically you have a lot more downtime um well in the nicu maybe not in the er <laughs> maybe, no not in the er but in the nicu on a good night i mean there's anything can go wrong at any time, of course, but sometimes they're sleeping and they're fed and they're stable and you don't want to wake them up. They need, they need sleep. Mm -hmm. So there tends to be some downtime at times. So, um, we just started talking and hitting it off and we had so much in common. Um, she is also a travel nurse and she's from California. I'm from New Jersey. And then we both kind of met somewhere in the middle and we both met our boyfriends while we were travel nursing. And then oh, they cool. came with us. So then we all kind of became like a group of four and started doing everything together, like trips all over the place. And um, yeah, just formed a really great friendship. And so we kind of started talking about how we both love to listen to podcasts, um, kind of talked about starting our own, but it wasn't very serious. And then it kind of happened around January, like this year, this new year, 2022, we were like, why don't we just do it? And if people listen, that's great. But if they don't, it's just fun for us to chat and connect. Um, So that's kind of why we started it. Um, The name (laughs) drunk or delirious comes from that feeling you get at night shift when it's like three in the morning and you're like, you're so sleep deprived and exhausted and you're like giggling. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but that's definitely happened to us on night shift before. (laughs) So that's where the name came from. But um, yeah, and we kind of just talk about whatever we want, but it's so far, it's mostly been about travel nursing since we both have experience in that. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about NICU nursing since that's both uh, what we both are. Uh, And we've had a few guests on. So we've talked to, I don't know if you've heard of NICU nerd. She's on Instagram. She, um, Mm -hmm. she's a nurse practitioner, a neonatal nurse practitioner. And she has like a really big following. She's actually one of my friends. So we had her on talk about the transition from RN to NP. Um, We've talked to the the creators of the MedVenture app. Um, Mm -hmm. I know, you know what that is, but for anyone who doesn't, it's a it's an app created by two amazing travel nurses. It's kind of like social media for travel nurses, not only travel nurses, travel healthcare professionals that Very. connect 
that they're is. a great duo and I love the app that they created yeah. they were actually at Travcon last year yeah. and they'll be here they'll be there again this year and they did a presentation so yeah Medventure is a very cool app it's very cool but yeah we, we're just having different guests and just chit-chatting about life and all kinds of fun things that's really cool when you were talking about the nurse practitioner I just finished recording with uh, a representative from the post university. They're also going to be at Travcon and awesome. they offer everything from BSNs to MSNs to nurse practitioner um, degrees, and also kind of like a bridge program between MSN and, and also an MBA, and they'll allow kind of a double bridge there. So different flexibility awesome. for, for education that people want to take, because there's a lot of people that want to be a nurse practitioner. Yeah. Like we give out scholarships every year and the majority of them are people taking their nurse practitioner. Wow. Yeah. There seems to be a really big push towards that. I remember even when I was getting my BSN, it was really talked about. It was like the push towards the next yeah. degree, whether it was that or nursing education or whatever it is. Yeah. I know a few people who um, did like a two-year program, um, got their RN and then the hospital will pay for you to get your RN after that too. So I think that's a good route too, but I do think that the push is for everybody to have their BSN. It really is. Yeah. How do you, do you talk about on your podcast, how to get through, there's a lot of people that would much prefer days. They don't want nights, Mm -hmm. but as a traveler, you kind of have to take nights or maybe a blend, or suddenly they find themselves on nights a little unprepared. Do you have uh, things that you talk about to help you get through? What kind of strategies you use to get through your night shifts? That's a great question. I think we're going to do an episode all about how to survive night shift. Mm -hmm. I think the truth is everybody does something different. And I don't think there's really a right way. There's things that can be helpful, but I just think night shift is so incredibly hard on your body and your mind. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, nurses mental health, I think really struggles, especially when you're, when you're on night shift, you're, you know, you're sleeping during the day, you're never seeing any light. And I think that really can affect people's yeah, mental health. You're not working out as much, your physical health, and then you're not eating well. And all those things can lead. I think if you do it for many years, it can really be destructive. So I think it's important if you do work night shift to just try to, um, you know, treat your, like treat your body and your mind as well as you can. So I think what I try to do is prioritize sleep. If I'm tired, I, I just let myself sleep. I used to, when I was younger, bounce back way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Quicker. I would be 22. I'd be going out after my last shift in the morning. For and you'd stay up all day. You'd stay up all day. Absolutely. Right. Crazy. The things that I used to do. Yeah. And I'd be fine. And I'd do day days, three in a row, like one week and then yep. the next day, week I'd, I'd be on nights and I didn't think anything of it, but then, yeah, I, I'm now we're six years in. It's like, okay, you can start to really feel the effects. So I let myself sleep. That's the number one thing. And I try to always make myself like eat a meal when I come home too. Cause I think I have the tendency to under eat when I'm on nights. Cause you come home and you're like, all you want to do is go to sleep, go to sleep, just crash, just fall over. Yeah. But I think it's important to eat something nutritious, you know, feel your body because sometimes you end up going like 12, 16 hours and you're like, my blood sugar must be zero because I haven't eaten anything. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, I think those are the top two things are like nutrition and sleep, but it is so hard. And I want to add to that. I find that hydration is oh. by far, you know, almost better than nutrition because I started to not eat when I came home and then I slept better kind of with an empty stomach, but staying hydrated, kind of starting with that water, right. At the beginning of the shift. Yeah. Uh, I had to do that. And I too, I was able in my twenties, I was like, this is no problem. And I, I just kind of stay up and stay active on my last day. And then I started to uh, struggle. So I was like, okay, I really need to be active. Let's play tennis. Oh my well, I, I broke a lot of rackets because My temper was a little short after those shifts. So I would like slam rackets and I'd break them until finally my husband's like, we're not doing this anymore. You are going to go to sleep and you're going to sleep for at least a few hours. So in my thirties, I would sleep a few hours. And now I'm like, you know, I I don't even try to do stuff on my day. And it takes me two or three days now to recover from a stretch of nights. Definitely want to do it in your, in your early twenties. And it's like, no problem. I can go all night. 
Yeah, which is why on night shift you find so many young new grads and new nurses. <laughs> well, and it, yeah, it's like you're only opening. Let's jump in. I though I've consistently found the best crews on nights. Do. They're, uh, they band together because you have to, there's less of you. And if somebody comes in, you kind of team up and you do that. You're, you're much more cohesive as a team than any day shift that I've worked with. They, they kind of have their own segment and their own pod, but I definitely like the, the enjoyment of, of how tight a night shift can be. I agree. I definitely agree with that. There's just a, it's a more, um, relaxed vibe like not always like that it's not always that the unit is calm Mm -hmm. but the people have a a calmness about them and like you said yeah the the way that they work together and they're um I don't know a lot of time they're more just like open and uh, willing to teach and understanding and everything like that so I've always enjoyed the night shift crew (laughs) yeah for sure now Emily is somewhere uh, on a different time zone right Yes. She's, she's actually still in Denver. She's in mountain time. And did I hear that she's now no longer a NICU nurse? She went into a different direction. That girl is all over the place. So she did um, stop being a NICU nurse for a a period of time, about almost a year and did some case management um, for pediatric home health. Mm -hmm. So she was able to do a blend of working from home in her home office. And then also, um, going out into the community and doing home visits and, and different things like that. So she's really enjoyed it. But then with this um, increase in rate travel rates, she went back to travel nursing. So she's doing a local contract right now, close by to Denver. Um, and I don't know how she's doing it, but she's doing her case management full-time during the day, during the week. And then she's working three nights a week. Oh no. I have no idea. Cause I think three nights a week is that's enough for me, but she's doing both. So She's, bank, she's banking it up right now. There's yes. a lot of, a lot of nurses that are interested in, you know, Hey, I've done it for five, 10, 15 years. I'd like to try something different And case management keeps coming up, uh, in terms of a, just a change. You're still connecting with patients. You're still doing it, but the hours are better. Um, the work is totally different, but you still get to use your skills. Yeah. So that's kind of neat. We're actually going to do a a session at TravCon this year specifically for case management, social work, that kind of thing, because there's a lot of interest in it. Yeah, there is. It's really cool for her too, because specifically the um, company that she's working for, it's it's pediatric. So a lot of the kids are ex-NICU babies. So she gets to see like what happens when they get to go home and the types of care that they need Mm long-term. So I think it's been really cool for her to see kind of like the full picture. That's very cool. Are we going to see both of you at TravCon this year? I think this was going to be your first year, right? Yeah, it's going to be our first year. Um, Actually, Em and Ryan, the MedVenture creators, they were talking about it. So they were like, you guys should come. We were like, oh yeah. I mean, we've definitely heard of it before, but um, they kind of put it on our radar. So yeah, we're definitely going to be there. We're really excited. It's every September in Vegas. And people ask why we don't move around, but we have looked, we've like checked out every major metropolis. There is an area that we can go. We need a huge exhibit hall. We have like over a hundred exhibitors come to the exhibit hall. So the exhibit hall itself is like just busting with energy. So we need a big space Mm -hmm. and the hotels that have that kind of big space, they usually have really expensive hotel rooms in different Mm -hmm. places that we've looked. So Vegas gives you the option. You can stay really close and get a decent rate. You can go to super cheap and still be on the strip somewhere. Uh, And it's also the cheapest place to fly into. So it's just consistently we've carved out this every September Travcon's in Vegas. And it's, it's once you go, it's like a real connection. There's, there's nowhere else you'll find that many travelers to connect with and travelers are the only ones that are going to get your lifestyle, right? They, nobody else understands this. You move every three months and you don't know where you are going to, you don't know where you're going to be next month. How do you manage that uncertainty? When are you going to settle down? Yeah. Yeah. Um, (laughs) You know, it's been many years and and my family was always like, you know, they, they kind of got used to it. They're like, where are you going next? And they'd start to look forward to where you're going next. Mm-hmm. And I loved that some of the assignments we stayed and we made six months because 
well, and many times it was skiing. We actually took the RV in Taos over the winter and it was cold, but it was great. And it's a super cool ski hill. If you ever want to get to, I'd love to visit there. I haven't been yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a tiny hospital. I don't know if they'd have a NICU, but they, every, every hospital has an ER. So an ER and an ICU. So Mm -hmm. I did ICU for the first few years and then I switched over to ER and I found that that was a really nice blend because in small towns, I would go to the ER, I'd have a bit of courage and I'd be like, okay, I can handle a small town ER. But when you got to a big city, then I'd be like, Hey man, I want to go hide out in the ICU and -hmm. just kind of find my little cubby hole and I'm good. Cause I don't like the whole trauma drama thing. Right. So so that combination really worked for me and some people do that, but most people I think stay in their own, um, singular specialty because it is a little harder to hop around with the other ones. It is. Yeah. I I can imagine going from ER to ICU. I mean, yes, it's both adults and yes, you're, you know, you might see ICU patients in the ER, but it is a completely different style of nursing. Very. I give you a lot of props for being able to flip flop like that, but it is cool to be able to have different, you know, specialties in your belt and then you can kind of whip them out and it gives you way more options, you know, when you're looking for travel assignments, whereas mine is very limited, like, um, just NICU. I mean, I guess there's different levels, but even at first for me, I started in level three NICU, Mm -hmm. which if, I mean, then, so level three is like, um, birth hospital, micro preemies, but not really as surgical and no ECMO micro preemies. That's the thing. Micro preemies. Yeah. That's like a 23 to about, I would say like 27, 28 weeks. It's like the the tiniest of the tiny. Wow. (laughs) Micro preemie. Okay. And then level four is a little bit more of like the larger surgical babies, chronic that they were probably once a micro preemie and they've just, you know, they've grown into like a bigger baby who may, might need a trach or a G tube or, you know, okay. something else. Um, so they really are different populations. So at first I didn't have that level four experience and that limited me on what, even which NICU contracts I could take. Um, now I can do anything, um, any level, but it, it takes experience to be able to get those assignments. Is there a level five? There is not. Okay. And <laughs> level then, four is the highest. And then what's a level one and a level two? Level one, I guess would be considered, um, it's kind of the same as like a, a nursery, um, maybe just a little bit of care. Like maybe they would be, they're monitoring blood sugars. Um, or maybe they'd be getting antibiotics there, okay. but really Pretty not basic. much more than, yeah. yeah, not much more than like mother baby, um, would be giving. And then level two, it's different every like state to state and hospital yeah. to hospital. But generally I would say like, they would take about 30 weeks of gestation and older, and they would only do maybe CPAP, but no intubated patients, um, they're not, you're not going to see drips or anything like that, okay. like more stable. And then level three does almost everything. I mean, you'll see drips, ventilators, um, and really sick patients there, but if they need surgery for the most part, there are some level threes though that do do surgery. So right. it's a little confusing, but generally the, I would say the majority of level threes don't do surgery. So they'll send out to the level four for that. So like a children's hospital, level four, um, a a maternity hospital, birthing hospital, level two or level three, typically. But it sounds like level three are your, um, the most critical micro baby, micro things. Sorry. Yeah, it just depends. I mean, you can, they're definitely really micro preemies are really micro preemies. Yeah. (laughs) But it's a totally different type of critical looking at that. And then you're looking at in a level four, you might have a baby that's been intubated for six months and they're not necessarily critical, but, um, they're still sick. Yeah. They're still sick. Yeah. And then, or then next door, you might have a kid on ECMO who's definitely critical. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's just different. I would say, yeah, bigger babies and level yeah. four where I am now. So Good to know, <laughs> I had no idea about the world of NICU. So thank yeah. you for that. Yeah. You're welcome. Do you have any, um, so your, your side gig is your podcast. Do you have any other things you obviously love skiing? Do you have any bucket list trips that you want to do or? 
Yeah, I am definitely into the outdoors and hiking. Um, and I kind of started loving all those types of things when I became a traveler. So um, I've done like I went down into the Grand Canyon and back out that long hike. I think it was like North or South or Rim. Um, I think we were on the South, nice. South Kaibab Trail. Yeah. yeah, South Rim. Um, we did Half Dome. Um, oh, cool. Just cool trips like that. Like we really like my boyfriend and I really love to do that. Um, so what's the one, is it have a soup falls? Is that the yes. one I think? it's Yeah. That's on my bucket list for sure. But I know you have to, it's like that's a, a hard one to get into. You have to go in with a tour. How do? what does your brother, uh, sorry, what does your boyfriend do when you're traveling? Yeah. So we met, um, on my assignment when I was in Seattle, he's from Washington originally. And at that time he was a financial advisor. So, um, his office closed down actually before COVID it was under going under construction or something. So he started working from home and kind of trialed it out. And I was like, Oh, I was thinking for your next assignment, we could go together. And I was like, okay, isn't that the dream to find somebody that. Yes, it is. So he started traveling with me and we traveled for about two years and he worked, was able to work from home. And then he wanted to go back to get his MBA. So now he's over at Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh. Um, and I tried to go back to Pittsburgh because that's where I went to school. Um, and I went back to my old job as a staff nurse. <laughs> I lasted about four months and I was like, I'm out of here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so. Was it the staff or was it just the fact that you enjoy traveling so much? It wasn't the staff. Um, they're great. I, I love that unit. It's changed a lot. Uh, there's yeah. a lot of new faces um, and a lot of my old friends are gone, whether it's for traveling, becoming a nurse practitioner, like we talked about, or they just are burnt out. Yeah. So a lot of new faces, everyone's great, but um, just was like a different vibe. And the pay was, I knew it was going to be a pay cut, but it was too much oh, of a pay cut. <laughs> Fair enough. It was like I could barely pay rent off of what the yeah. nurses in Pittsburgh make, and uh, yeah, what the Pittsburgh nurses make. It's kind of sad. So I was like, well, I can go to Philly, which is at least it's drivable, and and take a travel assignment there, and just save up some money, and then be more flexible and take some time off. <laughs> good, good plan. Mm-hmm. Well, good luck in all your adventures. If anyone wants to follow you, it's Hannah Quirk and she's on the Drunk or Delirious podcast, which you can download anywhere. We'll put the link in the notes as well. And you'll also be able to find Emily and Hannah at TravCon this year if you want to meet up and and check them out. So there'll be fellow NICU nurses there. Perfect. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Hannah, for taking the time out and good luck. Take care. You too. Thanks for listening to Travel Nursing and Allied Life. You can find the full show notes below or at travcon.org. Please help us out by rating our podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts.